name is Nancy Cantor, and I'm the hostess of the show, Dream Factory Community. And the Dream Factory Community is actually an organization in the local area that is designed to support women in taking on their life, their work, and their world. So in that quest, we have some simple, simple programming that helps women first get clear what their dreams are, create a plan, and then also look to see how do they create a community of support that will enable that plan and that dream to come true. So one of the things we do, a couple of things that we do, the first thing we do is we offer everybody a one-day training called Chief Dream Officer Training. So that's where they put that plan together. We also offer uh, what are called accountability circles. We call them Dream Factory Circles. And that's where women take their plan to a circle that meets monthly and they get support in fulfilling on that plan. And then the third thing that we do is we do events. And during those events, it's a wonderful opportunity for women to gather, to connect, to share their dreams, to contribute to each other, but also to be inspired about what's next for them. So every year we do a New Year's dinner. And so at our New Year's dinner this year, we had several components. We always support a charity. So this year's charity was the Can Mass Challenge on a 18 year rider. So we had a wonderful silent auction. A lot of the items were donated by Dream Factory members and were bid on by the people who attended our New Year's dinner. Uh, so we had the silent auction. But one of our speakers was Dr. Corey Cutler, is a oncologist at Dana Farber and he does research into stem cell transplantation and also hematology. And so the proceeds from our silent auction went directly to his research. So he spoke to us to inform us what has he been working on and a little bit of insight into the whole research element and uh, how what we're doing and the contributions that we're making make a difference. So he was one of our speakers. The other speaker who we thought was very inspiring, her name was Reverend Dr. Stephanie May, and she's actually a Unitarian Universalist minister, and she works at the Wayland Universal, Universalist Unitarian Church in Wayland. And she is an awesome speaker, and she spoke about values and how getting in touch with your values can really influence how you lead yourself and lead other people. And the other person who spoke to our group is actually our sponsor, and his name is Bing Yao, and he owns Doctors Express Franchise here in the Natick and Marlboro area. And he gave us some really good insight into you know, why people come to Doctors Express and how it's a great resource um, in, you know, in terms of your medical care that you can use instead of going to an emergency room, which is a lot more expensive, and just sort of how their business operates and how it is in service of the community. So, who was at this dinner? Well, I think you're going to see, you're going to hear from our speakers. You're also going to hear from some of our members. But usually we have about 40 to 50 women and some men that come to be inspired, to get clear what their dreams are, to have some insight into what could be next for them in 2016, but really just to enjoy each other and launch the new year. So we're really thrilled that um, that WACA TV supported us this year to film our speakers. So you'll get a sense of what people who participated in this event receive for themselves. So we appreciate you watching and we hope that you get empowered to live your dreams. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Hi there, my name is Judy Javangelo and I'm a longtime member of the Dream Factory community. Um, I met Nancy Cantor many, many moons ago when I was closing my business, a yoga studio in Medway, and um, I went into the Dream Factory as a way to continue to grow myself. And about two years into it, in the year 2009, um, the community was the greatest support of my life when I lost my middle child, Ben, to suicide. And um, it's through the Dream Factory community that I was able to shift and turn that tragic uh, event in my life into something very powerful and positive and through the tutelage of Nancy Cantor who was my coach for several years following that as well as the community itself I was able to start a nonprofit organization in my son's name called Ben Speaks Louder Than Words. So uh, Ben Speaks is now um, really coming along. Uh, it's six years old and 
just recently received $68,000 from the Yogathon at Gillette Stadium through Yoga Reaches Out. And uh, so that's just an idea of what can happen when you really apply the tools that Nancy's teaching. So I'm very grateful and uh, appreciate the opportunity to share my story. Thank you. Okay. So I just want to officially welcome everybody. I see you've all been eating and drinking and I hope and having coffee, which is kind of like drinking. And um, I just want, the first thing I want to do is I just really want to acknowledge our chef tonight, Greg Cantor. Didn't you do a big job? unbelievable cook around. But I could be prejudiced because he's my son. <laughs> All right, so if people don't know where you are, this is the Dream Factory New Year's Dinner. This is an annual event that we have every year for the Dream Factory community. And really, we're an organization that empowers women to take on their life, their work, and their world. So some people here are members. If you're a member of the Dream Factory, raise your hand. Yay! And if you're not a member of the Dream Factory, raise your hand. Okay, soon to become members of the Dream Factory. Yes, thank you. So, it's really great to get everybody together. I think the New Year's is a really good time to start looking at where do you want to go next. And so we're very fortunate we have Reverend Dr. Stephanie May, who's here tonight, who's going to be our speaker. We also have Dr. Corey Cutler here tonight, who's going to be our second speaker. And if you've noticed around, we have an amazing <coughs> silent auction. So we want you to buy raffle tickets and we want you to bid on things because the funding that you do, I don't know if people are familiar with the Pan Mass Challenge, it's the PMC. I'm an 18 year rider and I'm here with, where's Martha? Martha's here. Martha's also a rider for the PMC. And we're on a team called the Stem Cell Cyclists. And our funding actually goes to Dr. Cutler, and, he spe and he'll tell you more in detail what he specializes in. I think sometimes I mess it up. But hematology and stem cell transplantation. So he has a very unique niche, and he's going to tell you more about what he's done over the year. Because I always think it's important when you donate to something that you know what you're donating and who you're donating to. So that's why I'm thrilled that he's here tonight. So thank you so much for coming. Um, and the other thing I do want to say that the PMC, 100% of the donations go directly to the cause. Most things that you donate to, that is not the case. But because they're so, they have so much corporate sponsorship, that is the case. So you know whatever you donate tonight is going directly to the cause and you'll find out more about what that is. The other person I want to acknowledge is Bing Yao, who is our sponsor here. He's, from Doctors Express, and I just want to express my appreciation because your supporting us allows us to fulfill our mission, and our mission is to empower women. So, you know, we had an amazing meal. I find it very interesting. Here we are, mainly women, and I know there's one man, Robert, very courageous, thank you, and Adrian, where's Adrian? Thank you. I know. I will share. Halfway through, you're going to have to change tables because people get mad. Um, but you know, without the support of, of people like Bing, and really all the people that volunteered here tonight, so I also should acknowledge them before I bring Bing up. So first off, we want to acknowledge Greg. We've already done that. Hey. Yay, Greg. Hey. He's pretending he doesn't even care. I want to thank Sarah Morrow, who came early. She's been selling raffle tickets and helping with the coffee. Um, Nicolette, where's Nicolette? She's probably in the kitchen. She's, oh, right no, here. she's out there. So she was our check-in person today. And then the last assistant, oh, Adrian, where's Adrian? Adrian's here, he came early to help out. And then Josh is our videographer. He's gonna videotape our speakers, thank you. And he's from um, WACA TV, I know that sounds crazy, but it's, from, it's the Ashland Cable Station. And the Dream Factory community has had a show there for 10 years. So we're gonna figure out how we can kind of integrate what we're videotaping tonight into a show. And it will be seen in Ashland and Framingham. And we'll get a videotape, we'll get a DVD of it, so if people are interested, you get a chance to see that as well. But the last person I don't want to forget to acknowledge is Ellen Kiter. Woo! I, I, I can't even tell you all the 
things that she does. Maybe what she does best is she keeps me sane. And she's my right hand and my left hand. She, you know, we, we talk like 10 million times before she comes. And, and we talk 10 million times while she's here. And she's really my go-to person. So I want to thank Ellen for all that she does. Woo! And we did have an impromptu helper in Myrna. She just kind of stepped up into the kitchen. So thank you, Myrna. But I should stop because I can go on and on. Um, so I want to give Bing the opportunity to come up and just address the group and say a little bit about Doctors Express as our sponsor. So please do. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, I want to thank really Nancy for giving me the opportunity to, to really come here and, and, um, and speak in front of all, all you guys about my business. I, I never get tired about talking about my business. And so when there's an opportunity to, to talk in front of you guys, then I certainly jump on that opportunity. So um, well, first of all, uh, we've been around for about three and a half years. So I just want to uh, see who in the room have, here have heard of AFC Doctors Express. OK, well, so a handful of people, that's good. Who actually has been to a Doctors Express? OK, good, awesome. So hopefully uh, we don't have any uh, angry, uh, unhappy patients here. But uh, so, so for, for those who, who didn't know about Doctors Express Urgent Care, so what we do is, I think the best way to think about us is really we are a, we fill the gap between primary care doctors and the ER, OK? So when you are sick or if you've been injured, and you want to be seen, uh, up until recently, uh, for New Englanders, really the only option was to go to the ER. So imagine if you have kids uh, playing sports on a Saturday morning, if they sprain their ankles, you, you really you know, uh, didn't have a lot of choice uh, in terms of where to, to bring them. But now, uh, you've got all kinds of urgent cares popping up. Our, our company, which is a franchise company, uh, and I own two franchise locations, one in Adic, one in Marlboro, uh, it really kind of look at it and kind of serve that, that niche, if you will. Um, so, and so we provide seven-day walk-in medical care. So what that means is that if you have the need to be seen by a doctor, you can just walk into one of our centers uh, with no appointments needed, no referral. We take all major insurances. Um, and so the copay would be comparable to either your primary care copay or a specialist copay, depending on your, your particular uh, health plan. So we, we take your copay and we build the rest of the insurance companies, just, just like that. Um, so you might, you might wonder, so, so why, why do we want to, to uh, come to you guys as opposed to the ER, right? So I'm sure many of us have been to the ER, right? So I don't think we need really any reason for not going to the ER. Um, but I'll give you a couple. <clears throat> why, why you want to maybe come to an urgent care as opposed to the ER. One is, is, is cost, okay? So uh, many of us now have high deductible plans, right? So you would be, um, you know, a lot more interested in, in, in finding kind of a low cost option. Our cost uh, for a visit in our center is five or six times less than that of the ER, right? The insurance companies know it. That's why they're pushing for people to go to an urgent care as opposed to an emergency room, okay? So cost is number one. And number two um, is, we get you in and out within the hour, okay? Versus if you've been to the ER, you know that <laughs> the sometimes wait time could be, could be long. In Massachusetts, we actually have one of the longest ER wait time in the country, okay? So our ERs are, are congested, they're bombarded uh, with people that truly belong there, right? So if you, you got hit by a bus or you having a heart attack, you belong to the ER. <laughs> but if you're just having a rash that you want to find out what it is, you belong to an urgent care. All right, so that's why we, we sort of exist. So those are the two reasons why people would want to uh, come to an urgent care, uh, not uh, to, to the ER. Uh, our center is designed to be uh, just like a doctor's office, okay? Uh, so that's why we take a doctor's office copay or a specialist copay. But our office, I, I believe, is a little bit, um, I, think, uh, I think we do a little bit more than a doctor's office. For example, we, uh, we offer x-ray, so we have x-ray here. We also have a little lab. Uh, in our facility that we can draw blood and, and, and do all kinds of tests, okay? Um, and we open seven days a week. Um, and most doctor's offices are Monday through Friday, they close at five, okay? Uh, one, one statistic that maybe, maybe you're not familiar with, in this area, primary care, average primary care doctors here have over 2,500 patients in their panel, okay? So our primary care doctors are overwhelmed and, and, you know, luckily 80% of 
of us are healthy. We don't need to go see the doctors on a regular basis, but when we, when we do have the need, we can't get the appointments. The reason why we can't get the appointments is because our, our primary care doctors need to reserve that time uh, and the appointments for their most needed patients, which tend to be the elderly and, and the people that have chronic illnesses and so forth. So, so that's why you know, we believe that we serve a need and, and really provide that opportunity for people to, to, to really get seen uh, when they need to be seen, okay? Uh, and our cost is a lot lower. So that's why, um, and, and, and last thing I will mention that I think make at least my centers, I think unique to compare to other urgent care centers. Uh, uh, most other urgent care centers actually are staffed by nurse practitioners. I'm sure you guys have heard of uh, CVS mini clinics. Uh, those are uh, staffed by nurse practitioners, no doctors. Our centers are staffed by doctors. We do have nurse practitioners and physician assistants that we use for supplemental treatments and, and, and so forth, and they're there to treat patients, but they're there to, uh, under the guidance of, of the doctors there on site. So, so that's one difference. And also, we design our centers to be very um, uh, sort of customer friendly. We really take the approach uh, to sort of really kind of take healthcare to sort of the next level in terms of customer care. We have iPads in the waiting room for kids to play with. We offer coffee, snacks, cookies. Uh, pretzels for, for uh, yeah, so, so you know, for, for patients and so forth. So really just kind of, we're trying to, we have TVs in the, in the exam rooms, TVs in the, you know, everywhere in the waiting room. We're really trying to, to take the customer patient experience to the next level. So I think that's, uh, so I don't wish to see anybody at my center, um, but if you, if you do have a need, um, I, think, I think we're a much better option uh, to, to the ER. So I, I saw that you have your hand up, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So we would sometimes refer people there if we knew they were having, you know, it was the end of the day on a Friday or something like that. Um, but it would be great to have, you know, it would have been nice to have a face, you know, with, with that. And I think we would have been able to speak more eloquently about what you want to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, we, a lot of people actually, the, the, we, I've got uh, uh, one angry uh, uh, person on Facebook really just, cursing us out because they, they thought we were trying to replace primary care doctors and, and but that's not what we're trying to do. I mean we, we, we actually work very well with primary care doctors um, because they, they kind of see the need for it. They know that they're overwhelmed by patients and they, they really can't see all their patients so they very much see us as kind of filling that gap. Um, our top, my topic tonight as Nancy said is about values. The, specifically the relationship between our values, our purpose and our action, our actions or our behaviors. And I want to start by sharing a bit of my story and how evaluating some of my core values changed my life. And I just want to also tell you, as you've already gotten a clue, this is intended to be an interactive time. I'm not going to stand here and talk to you for the next 30 minutes. I want us to be able to interact. And I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to ask you to talk to each other a little bit and just sort of delve together into this topic of values. So I picked this particular slide, and if you can't see it, it's create a life that feels good on the inside, not one that just looks good on the outside. So I'm a minister. So my bread and butter is dealing with the inner life or the spiritual life. And I also think that these two things are connected, your inner life and your outer life. And I have to say that before I became a minister, as Nancy said, I was a um, professor and I taught, I had my degrees in um, religion, gender, and culture. So it's interdisciplinary between religious studies and women's studies with a particular focus on ethics. So I don't know when you hear the word ethics coming from a minister, if you're gonna think that I'm gonna start telling you how you should live your life, you know? And to me, there's a difference between sort of a morals, uh, morals and moralism of what you should and shouldn't do and values, which are the questions of, what is important to you? What matters to you? And then how do you live your life and shape your life around your own values? And I think that our values are part of this inner life that we have that shapes this outer life. So I want to invite us all into sort of a reflection about our values. 
So this is my story. That's my son, who just, um, it's old, but it's adorable picture. Um, he just applied for colleges, <laughs> so like, he's a little older now. But, um, but that's definitely my favorite picture of all time. So the thing about my story is I grew up in Michigan to a very conservative Christian family in the 70s and the 80s. And the 70s and the 80s in the evangelical Christian world was the era of family values, right? So when you hear that phrase, family values, especially if you're thinking back to the 80s, what comes to mind? Eating together. Eating together. Praying. Praying together. Tesco. <laughs> <laughs> that was the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of these names, James Dobson, James Dobson's face, you know, um, real stress, uh, uh, emphasis on your heterosexual married family. And this, remember Murphy Brown? This woman who dared to become a single mom? Yeah. And, you know, and these were very contested questions and issues in the 80s. And you know, if you imagine, you know, 25 years later, that same-sex marriage would be the law of the land, it's kind of shocking to um, realize how far the society has come generally. And so, growing up in that environment, marriage was a inc really important value. In fact, my grandparents, who are still alive, just both in their 90s, have now been married 70 years. And my other grandparents um, were married for 55 before they both died. And my parents are still married at, I think they're coming up on their 50th, I should check that. Um, and, and so marriage was a really important thing in my family. And so I'm from the Midwest, we get married young out there. So I was 24 years old when I married a man who I had um, worked with. And it turned bad really quickly. Like the day after we got married. <laughs> you could argue the morning of, but um, and, and so it was, um, you know. And I'm sitting in this marriage. It was very clear to me that this was not a good marriage. It, the choices he was making, both in his own life and also um, that impacted our household, you know, our interactions with each other, I was pretty miserable. But it's marriage. You're supposed to stick with it. You're not supposed to ever end marriage. In my family, and my religion, everything said you have to stick with marriage. And so what happened is what I call a tectonic shift. Or it's what I refer in my own sort of sense of spirit and in my values. So to that date, to that point, my key values were obedience in some ways, you know, following what I had been told. Um, listening to my parents, to my religion, and, and yet it was killing me, my spirit. And, and so I needed to change my values, my deepest core values. And so what I decided one day, well, one day, it was a long process, was that what, I, that what God cared more about was the well-being of myself and my son that God cared more about my life than about the rules. And so my new values are came, I came to describe them as light and life, which you could also understand as hope, this idea of light, that sense of hope, that things could get better, I wasn't stuck, and also the sense of life and the flourishing of life and love and goodness. So I took a deep breath. With the support of my parents, I divorced and became a single mom. And as a single mom, I headed to seminary. So I'm in seminary, and it still is a place with a lot of um, married, single people or married families. And I was feeling out of place. And I was feeling like my family of myself and my son didn't really measure up. We still were as good as the proper model of what a family should be. And then one day, and I'm sorry I'm gonna play this, I know it's gonna make some of you have bad flashbacks, but um, I heard this. Oh, that's 
because I have so many friends that I love. <laughs> was obsessed with, like many kids of that era. Um, it's like, yeah, we're a family. I love you, you love me, we're a happy family. And again, it was that shift of values. So instead of valuing a particular model of what family should be or must be, I realized family was defined by love. And my son and I, and in a lot of ways, this whole network of friends I developed at seminary, we were family. And they're still part of my family, some of those friends. And the, those relationships of love mattered more than that model and that structure. So I started in my academic work. I tend to always integrate my intellectual work in my life. So my academic work I did in seminary, I did a lot of research and writing about single parents and social change. And in talking about the ways that there was, you know, actually that the, just fairly recently, there are more single parent headed households now than there are married households. It just passed about three, four years ago. Um, so there's been a big change in society. And, and so that was a lot of I did my master's program. I then went on, because I do love school, and be, to uh, start a doctorate at Harvard Divinity School. And there I started asking questions even more broadly about language, I moved from language of family to language of home. And I started thinking about what are our models for home? And I did, I, I'm, my friends know me as the person who actually critiques home. And a lot of my critiques of home have to do with this, again, this idea like there's a single model of what home should be. And actually, we dwell together with each other in all kinds of different ways. And so I started thinking about home not in terms of one single static model of what a home should be, but I started thinking about it as a kind of an anchor in the midst of the constellations of relationships that make up our lives. So we all have all kinds of relationships that make up our lives. So just like think the biggest kinds of relationships that make up your lives. What kind of relationships do you have in your life? Friends, girlfriends, yes, here we go. My dog, my dog, <laughs> dog. colleagues, um, colleagues, students, students. Oh, food. Yeah. <laughs> Relationship with food, yes. <laughs> That's a powerful one. <laughs> Lovers. Organizations. Organizations. Yeah, I was gonna say auto mechanic clerks at the grocery store. Like workout friends. Workout friends. Nature. So, nature. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So we live in these constellations of relationships. And it's a big world. And so when you live in these all these different relationships and all of these different demands and responsibilities on your life, I think you need a way to orient yourself in the midst of the universe of your relationships and to figure out what is it that's at the core of what's important to you? Because we know that our life and all of these relationships and responsibilities can fill as vast as the starry sky on some days, right? And, and I think that finding your core values are kind of like, you know, if you're looking for the um, North Star, if you're trying to find the Big Dipper, what do you do? You look for the North Star, right? and the North Star, and then you can start to see the rest of the constellation around it. So I think of values as the kind of home or the, that functions like the North Star. It gives you a place to start, to think about how do you orient yourself in the midst of all of these different relationships. Oops. A lot of practice using a PowerPoint. 
Um, they don't let me use one on Sunday morning. <laughs> it's back in my teaching days. Um, so the big picture. So before we get to values, I want to start with that sense of that constellations, these relationships, this world in which we live. And think about part of the big picture of when we think about our lives is our, are our needs. What do we need to live? So I want to actually, if you, you have paper, so yeah, if you could take a minute and just think about all of the different things that you need to live, whether it's physical and material, social, emotional, or spiritual. Think about the various needs in your life. I'll give you a minute. So how many times have you heard that or maybe said it? I struggle with balancing work and home. And, you, and often it's almost like all of our needs are sort of categorized as either work needs or home needs. And then where does it leave you feeling? To me, it leaves me with a sense of I'm never balanced. They're always competing for each other. And it's always, I'm not falling short at work, I'm not doing enough for my kids, my son, you know. And there's always that sense of imbalance. You have that sense that you have this fullness of responsibility and needs, but that model, that language of balancing, I think it hurts more than it helps. Yes, yep. I agree. There is no balance. <laughs> there is no balance. There is no balance. There isn't. There's no of it. So this is how I think about things. So if you have this multiplicity of human needs, and, and often work and home, and this actually, I can give you a whole lecture on the history of this, <laughs> I'll spare you. But it comes back from the 19th century, basically, where there's this real separation of work and home for the first time, where people would go to work and earn wages, and then you had the home. And so human life became segregated, and those, and those spheres were gendered, right? Women were supposed to be in the home, men are supposed to be at work, and we've been do fighting ever since about that, where, where women belong and don't belong. And, and, and then there's that tension. Well, now we're going to do, we belong in both places, but now we're struggling with that balance. The way I think about it is, no, we have life. We have one integrated life with a set of, const uh, this whole constellation of relationships and needs. And the question isn't how do we balance? The question is, how do we integrate them all in a way that allows our own spirits to thrive and to feel a sense of wholeness, of happiness in who we are? Which leads us into the next part of the big picture, of what are your values? So in the midst of all of these different choices you could make in this vast universe, and sometimes it might not feel like we have a lot of choices, we got the kids that just want to eat, right? <laughs> but, but still, we have all of these choices and these relationships in our lives. And so how do we navigate and, and make decisions about what we're going to do and how we're going to invest our time, our energy, our money? So Nancy mentioned that um, we ran into each other at Star Island, which is a, um, it's a retreat center off of the Isle of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, in the um, ocean. It's just gorgeous. I've never been there before. It was still probably one of my happiest weeks of my life. And they have a Minister of the Week, and then they also have a weekly speaker. And the speaker that came that week was a man named Mark Fernandez, who worked for a quarry, a stone company. And, and we're all like, well, what are you doing here, you know? And, and what was so interesting is the owners of this family-owned company, going back generations, had made a decision that they wanted to prioritize the life of their employees and to be a different kind of boss and a different kind of company. So one thing, it's a, it's a fascinating long story, but basically it led to a place where they believe in values-based leadership. And so they have all of their employees identify their core, core values, and they go through this whole program of making sure that they are living in accordance with their values while they're there. And so Mark became what's called the chief leadership officer. And it's part of the core part of their business that they send Mark and a couple others to seminars all over just to teach values. So this is a stone company, and you know, if you've ever played um, tennis, they do like hard court, the, the um, surfaces for tennis courts. I mean, they're just a stone company. 
But yet, they're using their profits to fund these people going out and teaching about the importance of knowing your values in your leadership. So this is a promo video of the company that I just think is fabulous. Pretty cool, isn't it? It's Luck Companies, and their tagline is um, values-based leadership. Luck, luck, like L-U-C-K. Yeah, and their logo is a four-leaf clover. So, so the question. I mean, they use the language of values-based leaders, and certainly a big part of this organization, as I understand it, is about leadership. You know, part of where my life journey has led me to be a minister is the kind of leadership I offer is trying to encourage people to ask some of these big questions, to think about the big picture, and to think about what it would be to have a values-based life. I love that, if you caught it, it went by kind of quick, I love this quote that's in the video. You are the best version of yourself when your purpose aligns with your values and your values are reflected in your behaviors. And so that's that piece I was talking about, that there's that connection between what it is that you value, that inner part of you, that you know what's the deepest, most important things that matter to you, and that you then live in accordance to that, that those two things are tied to each other, and that that actually helps you to feel like you're living a purposeful life. And Sometimes I think that you think about, for me, like I think about, oh, purpose. That means that I'm going to save the world or the penguins or something, you know. And, and sometimes, I mean, your purpose can be, I value being caring. I value stability. I value love. And being a really great mom that's always there for your kids gives your life purpose. So it doesn't have to be these grand things. Sometimes, well, I mean, being a mom can be pretty grand too, but, um, you know, it's, it's all of these daily things of, that what are our core values that we can take. And again, it's this big picture of life. I think if you think about that integrated whole of what your life is, our values crisscross. They don't say, well, now this is my work value, and now this is my home value. Generally, they, they inter help to integrate everything that you are responsible to and the needs that you have. So I want to encourage you now to take out the other bit of paper that has all the list of the core values. And I do have the website here. Um, they have the same thing online. It's called um, 
igniter.valuesbaseleader.com. And they have an interactive thing that you can do online. And this is their list of values. And arguably, there's more values that could be on this list. But the way that they break it up and encourage you to break it up is to think about core values in terms of what is critical, what is most important, what is somewhat important, and what is not really that important to you. And does everyone have a sheet? And so, this, I encourage you to take this home and think even more about it, but for right now, I would like you to look carefully at that list and identify five candidates for what could be your critical values. And I want you to write, you can circle them on the handout, but then when you're done and you've got a good sense of what those five critical values for you are, if you can write those on your um, star piece of paper. You know, sometimes I wonder why I do it. Because I spin all year round, I train all year round, I, I fundraise, you know, all, all the above. And what I realize the reason I do it is I do it because I can. I am so blessed that I can. And so I think that's important. When you can, you do. And if you can help somebody, that's important. You know, we just had a, this might be a little of a side, but one of our members, Karen Piedra, sent out an email that there was a woman in need of who had no electricity and no heat. And it was during one of those days, it was pretty cold. It's like one of those days where I put on my little space heater because I go, oh, I'm kind of chilly today. You know, I think I'll put on my space heater. And I just started thinking about, here's a woman who like doesn't have heat in her house. That doesn't work. And so luckily, you know, I network a lot. And you know, as a member of the chamber, I know the woman who's a community liaison for the electric company. So I immediately contacted her. She found the right person for this person to talk to, and she got her heat turned on today. Yeah. So yeah. I think there's a power in community, and I think when you have intentions, you know, you live your values, you have intentions, you can make changes. And one of the things about, you know, for, you know, riding the PMC, sometimes it's hard. You know, like if you think about going up a lot of hills, we ride a... You know, we're, we're the wimps. We go from Wellesley, so we only ride 165 miles in two days. So think about that if you've ever been on a bike, what that might feel like. And I've got to a thousand times. <laughs> so sometimes you wonder if that's exactly what you want to do, but then you think of people who are battling cancer, and it's nothing. It's really nothing. It's something but it's not what other people are dealing with. And I really do feel like my motto has been, it takes a, commu it takes a community to cure just about anything, and it, takes a co it definitely takes a community to cure cancer. So I'm very grateful because every year I listen to Dr. Cutler speak, and it always inspires me to ride the PMC again, because I know who he is, and I know what he works on, and I know where my money's going, and I know where all this energy, what's, it, what's in service of. And so I so appreciate, and he also comes here every year to speak to us. And I just want to give you a little background on Dr. Cutler, is that he speaks to like events where there's 4,000 physicians, right? So you can kind of picture that. He's a world-renowned physician, he's a researcher, um, and then he comes here to speak to us. So I'm just so honored that you're here. <laughs> we're not like 4,000 physicians, but we're pretty damn cool. <laughs> Thank you. So this is my second or third year speaking here, and it's always a pleasure. But I'm going to start tonight first by crying foul for two reasons. Number one, I'm just a doctor, and you just had a talk by a reverend doctor, so I should have been the warm up. And number two, uh, I was not told I was allowed to bring PowerPoint slides. I'm really, really good with PowerPoints, but with this behind me, I'm not so good. So um, I'm going to talk to you. Uh, a little bit about what I do, my involvement with Nancy, with the PMC. I'll start by saying I'm about to be a second year PMC rider. Uh, I rode last year, I did a 50 miler, and this year I'll do a 80 something or other, whatever Nancy says I should do this year. Um, and so uh, the reason why I ride is because uh, the funds that Nancy and the team she belongs to, the stem cell cyclists, have supported me uh, and my work uh, 
incredibly generously in the last 12 years or so, and the members of Nancy's team and everyone who's here tonight and who's been involved in the team um, have become family members of mine. Uh, they come to my house once a year or twice a year for brunch and I go out for dinner with them when I can. And so this concept of bringing your values from what you do at work to your home uh, has really actually impacted me in my daily work and uh, is the reason why I keep doing this. So let me tell you a little bit about what I do uh, and where some of the, the funds that are generated this evening are actually going towards. So uh, I am a hematologist oncologist at the Farber. I've been there since 1999, I think. I came down to the States uh, to train. I'm originally from Montreal in Canada. Uh, so I came down to the Farber to learn a specialty and to, uh, to learn how to become a, a specialist hematologist. And uh, they kept paying me, so I stayed. And so I've been on staff since 2002. And I'm, uh, I'm within the stem cell department at the Farber, and I'm a clinical and research stem cell transplant physician. So there are many different reasons why people go into medicine. Um, there is the altruistic, I'm going to heal this person in front of me. There are all sorts of motivations of why people go into medicine. Um, I think I was sort of a 17-year-old kid. I was pretty good at school and I liked science. So someone said, well, why don't you apply to med school? And so that's what I did. Uh, and here I am, many years later, uh, still loving what I do. So I do uh, research in bone marrow transplants. And for those of you who don't know what bone marrow transplant is, this is when we actually transplant one immune system from one individual into the body of a cancer patient, usually, sometimes not cancer patients. But we use, it, we use the immune system and the stem cells to fight cancer. We are not the bastions of last resort. We are actually recognized real therapy for people who have uh, treatable diseases. Um, I treat patients with leukemia and pre-leukemia and lymphoma and myeloma and diseases of the bone marrow and the blood forming organs. So my work is in a very, very, very sub, sub, sub specialized field that doesn't interest too many people. And that's a problem when it comes to things like my research and drug development and getting money to do the work that I think is important. So what I study in particular is this phenomenon called graft versus host disease, which none of you have heard of, but is sort of what I deal with on a daily basis. I transplant bone marrow, but I'm going to take you back a step. Think about the scenario when someone gets a kidney transplant or a heart transplant or a lung transplant. It's a very common scenario these days. And what happens when you put a foreign organ into somebody else's body is that person's body decides it does not belong there, right? We all have immune systems. The job of the immune system is to recognize foreign things that don't belong in one's body and to reject that. So if you get a kidney transplant, your immune system is gonna to try to reject that kidney. And we give people medicines to prevent rejection. And sometimes it works and sometimes they lose those organs. And it could be a fatal complication when you have a thing like a heart, which you can't just take out or replace quite easily. Now what I do in bone marrow transplantation is exactly the opposite of kidney transplants and heart transplants. I am transplanting an immune system into someone's body. And that immune system shows up and says, hang on a second, this is not my skin, this is not my liver, these are not my eyes, not my mouth, not my bones, my muscles, my joints. And that transplanted immune system tries to reject the body that it is now firmly living in, and we have no way of taking it out. Okay? So we call that graft versus host disease. And it's one of the major complications of bone marrow transplant. It's the number one cause of failure, and by failure I mean real failure, uh, in bone marrow transplantation. So I study ways to prevent and to treat this disease. Now, you might imagine with eight or 10,000 of these transplants done in the country per year, and maybe a third to a half of people getting this rejection, you're talking about a market of three, four, 5,000 patients a year. There aren't too many drug companies that are very interested in what I do, unfortunately. 
And so one of my challenges on a daily basis is to deal with these drug companies. Beg, plead, you know, things like that. Spend a lot of time sort of groveling, uh, looking for money and looking for drugs to treat our patients who have these life-threatening problems. And so my involvement with the stem cell cyclists is such that they provide to me seed money to do novel, sometimes a little experimental, sometimes a little bit crazy research on our patients to try to improve the field of bone marrow transplant as a whole. And so I'll relay to you one of these stories and how the cyclists were an instrumental part of sort of a being on the ground floor of some fundamental discoveries that have led to very big things in our field. So a, a group of talented individuals in one of our labs that I work with at the Farber had determined the reason why women don't do well when transplanted into men's bodies. Can you imagine? <laughs> can, you, can, you, can you even imagine? So, so the story is fascinating. It turns out that as women, not you men, you possess two X chromosomes, and three or four of us in this room have a Y chromosome. And there are certain genes on the Y chromosome that are not found in women. That's what makes us boys. And when you put a female immune system into a male body, the female immune system does not recognize these genes or these proteins as being even human. They don't, they don't fit. But, well, men are a little more complacent, it turns out. A man into a woman's body works just fine. Um, so the, the, it, it turns out, we didn't know why, but it turns out that the rejection rates are higher when you transplant a female immune system into a male body. And sometimes, if you have a sister that's going to donate to a brother, this is our only option. So when we have to, we use female donors into male recipients. But a group at our, one of our labs determined that the B cell system, one of these immunologic cell types that makes antibodies or uh, immunoglobulins for the scientific word, um, these antibody producing B cells, which were thought to not play any role in bone marrow transplant, go crazy and react against these male proteins and make all sorts of antibodies and start this whole immune response that culminates in rejection, or what we call graft versus host disease. All right? So here I am, surrounded by these smart people in the lab who have figured this fundamental scientific pathway out. And we, as clinicians and clinician scientists, say, how do we fix this? And so we said, okay, if it's this B cell system that is so important in causing this rejection, this fundamental pathway causing rejection from females to males, what can we do to turn off this female immune system or this B cell system? And so we go to the books and we see that there are a number of good drugs out there that specifically target B cells in the immune system. And for those of you who have ever uh, known anyone with uh, a disease called lymphoma, you'll know that we use a drug called rituxan uh, very frequently to treat this disease. Rituxan is this magic bullet that specifically attacks B cells, and B cells are cancerous in lymphoma. So here we have this drug on the market, approved, selling uh, two to three billion dollars a year. You know this drug? Big drug. It's, a, it's one of the, these original blockbuster cancer drugs, billion dollar drug. Okay. So we go to the company that makes it, and that company will remain nameless here tonight. <laughs> and we say to them, we have this idea. Will you give us some drug and some cash to run a trial of your compound, which is selling two point something billion dollars a year already to treat lymphoma, and we want to treat 20 patients with this graft versus host disease to see if maybe it can work. And the company says, no. So after, and they, and they rightfully say no, right? They're a company. Their job, no matter what their logos and their company value statements say, it's true, this is what companies do. They're companies. Their job is to make money. So they say, no, 
we don't see a future in us marketing that compound for this disease at this time. And there's all sorts of issues about when their patent is expiring, et cetera, et cetera. So it takes me six months, but I managed to finagle them into giving me 20 vials of their drug to treat 20 patients. Okay? A vial they sell for 40 grand ish. Their cost, about $9 at this point. Okay? <laughs> the drug's been on the market for many years. It's, it's going off patent soon. They've got stockpiles of this stuff. So now I've got 20 vials or 20 doses of this drug, and I have more than 20 patients, but it actually takes money to run a clinical trial because I have to deal with the Food and Drug Administration, regulatory agencies, my own research pharmacy. I've got to pay my research staff. And at the end of the day, I have to justify my own time as a researcher working at the Farber, bringing, I have to bring in some income to buy my time to do this research, right? Because my job there is to treat patients and to generate a little bit of clinical revenue to support the research mission. So one way I can do research is by bringing in cash to say, okay, I've now blocked off 10% of my time to do research by bringing in X amount of dollars. And so that's where the stem cell cyclists come in. All right? So for about four or five thousand dollars of patients, really what it costs for us, I can run this trial in 20 some odd patients. So it's 80 to 100 thousand dollars. It sounds like a ton of money in our field. It's a pittance, sadly. So we go ahead and we run this trial, and guess what? It works. 65%, almost two-thirds of the patients get better. Great. We're not the only ones who've caught on to this. A couple of other groups worldwide do this. Ours is the biggest and probably the best trial, but it works. So we say, okay, if we can treat this rejection, maybe we can prevent rejection, because you know, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So we decide to go to the company and say, now we're gonna do something bigger. We're going to try to prevent this. 20 patients, not quite enough. We're gonna do this in 80 patients. We get a statistician to tell us 80 is the number. So we go to the company. This time, they're a little intrigued because they got follow-on compounds with evidence of efficacy and it hasn't cost them a dime yet. Right? So here I am, I'm developing a drug for this company gratis, basically. And they say to me, of course we'll you know, supply drug for, uh, for you. No cash, but we'll, we'll give you drugs. So they gave me 80 doses this time. Uh, at this point, we needed real money, because this is a very large 80-person multi-center trial we got about a half a million dollar grant from um, a nice organization based out of Chicago that's affiliated really with the Cancer Treatment Centers of America that you're probably all familiar with. They give us about a half a million dollars to run this trial. That's what it costs to run this 80 person, um, two year study. And so we give 80 people this drug before they get rejection. And guess what? We prevent it in the vast majority of people. So here we are. Zero dollars out of the company, zero dollars out of the Farber budget. But from the seed that we got from the stem cell cyclists, we've now got two successful trials. <clears throat> and patients who are actually better because of it. Yay. Big yay. <laughs> so now we're entering the big leagues. So now we've got a real concept. We've got a drug that really works. And now we have big plans, right? So we design a huge program based around this concept that the B cell is important in this rejection. And I get a guy in the lab to design this whole set of series of scientific experiments around the B cell. And I get a guy who does bone marrow transplants in mice to design a whole series of experiments around the B cell. And I design a series of experiments in people uh, to determine the role of the B cell and to try to move this one step further. And we put this together as part of a, 
we call a program project grant at the NIH. Okay? So you go from philanthropic money, seed money from the stem cell cyclists, from events like this, to half a million dollar grant from a cancer research organization to what the highest level of funding is in our field, federally funded dollars, your tax dollars. Okay? Not an easy bar. And it takes us two years to go through the federal hoops, if you will, reviews, criticisms, a little disappointment, um, a lot of paperwork, and what turns out to be an 800 page application at the end of the day. 800 pages, I'm not kidding, 800 pages on PDF. Uh, and we actually get federal funds to now run a definitive, randomized, controlled, you know, all the magic words in science of how to prove whether this works or not. So we get 8.2 something million from the feds to do this, okay? So that's like an eight year, nine year journey, I think, from when we started. But when you think about where we started from, it was an idea, it was $50,000 from the stem cell cyclists, and eight or nine years ago, that was most of what the gang raised in a given year. And we're on the verge here of a major breakthrough to me, not to, you know, not to the world at large, for a small number of patients, um, of what we can do. And so, when you think about why you're coming to events like this and what you're supporting with, with silent auctions and donations to Nancy's ride and whoever else wants to ride this thing, and I encourage you to do it because it's a hell of a lot of fun, um, you can see how a really small start for someone like me becomes this huge blossom thing from you know, what turns out to be a very, very, very modest, modest beginning. And so that's what you're supporting when you come to events like this and when you uh, help Nancy out with her ride. Uh, it's been fantastic working with the gang because I have four other stories like this. Um, you know, we can't just be doing one sort of, you can't put all your pokers into one fire in our world because sometimes these things don't work out. And for every one of these, positive stories, I've got, sadly, two or three ideas that just didn't work, unfortunately. But that's okay, that's why we do this, that's why we do science, because there is an answer in science. Um, uh, those of you who were here last year, you heard me, t who was here last year? Remember the story I told you about fish? The zebrafish. The zebrafish, is that a great story? That was a great story. It's a fantastic story, right? It's working. Okay, so I told this story about how we developed this drug in zebrafish that made stem cells go crazy in the lab, and how we transplanted them, they grew great, fantastic. The zebrafish story is working. Guess what? It's not making money. The company pulled the plug three weeks ago. Oh, no. yeah. right. So that's why we have to do things like this and why we need so many pokers in the fire so that at the end of the day, you hope that one of these things actually makes a real, a real impact. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop. I'm happy to, to stick around and talk about biology and graft rejection and stuff like that. I know it's... I know it's <laughs> um, so the zebrafish was a great story. We, we study zebrafish in the lab for a couple reasons. We study the way they make blood. Because it turns out we're not all that different than fish. Um, and the way fish make blood is mirrored in humans. And the reason why we study zebrafish is because they're transparent, so we can look right into them with a microscope and see what's going on inside them. Their systems are very similar to humans, and they reproduce like crazy. So we, we can study a lot of them at once. And so we found a drug that makes zebrafish make more stem cells. And we went from the fish to the mouse to human cells in the lab and eventually brought it after a few years into humans. And this company was spun off by the group that discovered it because that's what you do, you make a company. Uh, and we did a trial 
in a small number of people and it worked great. So we did a, started a bigger trial in 60 people and we enrolled 49 out of 60 and the data were great. I mean, really good, game changing. This is for people getting cord blood transplants, um, stem cells from umbilical cord blood from when babies are born, okay? Tiny market, tiny market, a thousand a year in this country. Tiny market, but this company was gonna, gonna develop this. And so they took this fantastic data to the FDA literally two months ago and they showed them this data and the FDA was, this is fantastic. Here is how you design your next trial and if you do this trial and the trial works, you will be granted a license to market this drug. And so the trial that we had, we were almost done was about 60 patients, took us two years and the FDA said to them, your next trial is going to be approximately 240 patients and here's what you need to do and here are the criteria and here's what it takes to get over the hurdle to get a drug approved in this country and the company said 240 patients nope not going to happen going to take us seven years we're going to lose our patent everyone else is going to copy us we're done and that was it sad but that's that's the that's the nature of the game we play in so we we invested seven years of academic endeavor uh, for the company to say we're done. So I don't want to end on a bad note. But, but, um, well, I hope you'll find some other company. Well, yeah. Somebody else. There's always another. There's always another idea. That's the beautiful thing about our world. All right. Thank you. I'm Maura Jane Griffin. I'm a member of the Dream Factory community and have been for about six years. Um, I met Nancy Cantor um, through mutual friends and have done business with her and come to know the women in the factory and found that there's a very diverse group here um, of very successful entrepreneurs and women who have been in a career and are looking for a career change. Nancy helps to coach them and there are different groups around the state that Nancy has founded that provide support to each other. So it's a very supportive community of women of all ranges of education. The only thing necessary is that you want to empower yourself and make a change in your world and in your own life.